So in my dissertation, I'm basically attempting to cosmologize. I'm trying to engage poetically in the endeavor of world making, um, cosmopoesis, you could say. I'm trying to um, generate a new form of order, um, to engage in a form of cosmogenetic philosophizing. And my main inspirations are Alfred North Whitehead, um, this gentleman, and um, Friedrich Schelling, uh, those two especially, with a little bit of um, the 20th century esotericist Rudolf Steiner sprinkled in. And it's a work of cosmology or philosophy of nature, and I'm, I'm trying to give an account. Um, uh, you could I'm going to, after Gilles Deleuze, um, describe what I'm doing as a kind of science fiction. Um, I'm going to tell the story of the ether, um, which is a, a theoretical posit, which has been present with science since the beginning. And, and you can begin, you know, either with the scientific revolution, if you want to say some new form of modern cosmologizing called physical science, modern mathematical, empirical, physical science, which just emerged um, as Athena from the head of Zeus, you know, in the 17th century. Or you could, you know, I'm really meaning to include also that more ancient sense of science, uh, philosophy, um, because all the categories that uh, modern scientists use in order to describe nature were invented um, by ancient philosophers. So science, natural, natural physical science, is a branch of the philosophical tree. And in order to understand what science is doing, we need to turn to philosophy. Science cannot provide you with its own self-understanding. Um, to understand science, uh, you have to put it in a wider context. I mean, to do science, let's say, to be a scientist, to engage in experimental or, or mathematical um, science, you don't need to be philosophical. You don't need to have a philosophical understanding of um, what what you're doing means. But if you do want to have an under understanding of what science is actually doing, and if you want to have at least, uh, uh, if you want to at least attempt to understand what all the special science, because really there's no capital S science, right? There's a series of scientific research programs um, with different measuring instruments, different technologies, different amounts of funding, uh, of training and expertise, of um, shorter or longer histories of development. Every special field of science is bringing forth its own domain of, of nature. Right? And to what extent these different domains, these um, special sciences are able to talk to one another, to coordinate not only their data, but their theories about that data, is not a given. You know, sometimes links are made, and when that happens, you, know, you get major breakthroughs. But in general, science is, science is really plural. There are sciences. And so to talk about some unified scientific picture of nature as a whole is a little bit premature if you're only pretending to be scientific about it. Philosophically, you know, that's when um, you have, that's where you have to turn to philosophy, I think, in order to grasp what it is we mean when we talk about nature and the scientific method. Um, all sorts of assumptions are made about the nature of the human knower that precede scientific um, uh, our own that precede our own understanding of scientific investigation. Um, so, all that said, you know, and while I'm trying to do a work of cosmology in my dis dissertation, um, I'm also trying to, in a sense. Uh, philosophically contextualize science. I think that's that's what cosmology is, right? It's the philosophical contextualization of natural science. And that, that's what it should be today. Um, 
and I think in the 20th century, you know, in the post-Newtonian century when quantum and relativity theory and evolutionary theory had fully um, migrated the sciences into a new paradigm, um, you know, that requires a new philosophical conceptualization than, say, Newton or Descartes had of, of what they thought they were doing. One of the best uh, minds of, of the 20th century, to live through the 20th century, um, who was positioned perhaps as well as anyone to understand both what was happening in natural science and physics, relativity, quantum theory at a mathematical level, um, and, and also the one who was best positioned to understand this philosophically um, is, is Alfred North Whitehead, uh, right, who was a mathematician, was a physicist, was one of the few physicists in Europe who could understand Einstein um, in the years following 1905. Um, and he has interesting critiques of Einstein, right? And I'm actually, I want to read a little bit about this because, you know, where Einstein was a um, unabashed Spinozist, a, a monist, a, you know, believer in a sort of holistic determinism um, where all is one and the one is God and God is entirely necessary and so completely determined. And we as finite beings are actually just temporary cases of mistaken identity who, upon death, will remember through a form of intellectual um, love, become one with the infinite again. Now, Whitehead is more of a pluralist, I think. He's more um, of an inheritor of, of Leibniz than he is of Spinoza, though he inherits both, right? Because what is Leibniz but a response to Spinoza. Um, so Whitehead tries to bring in plurality and instead of talking about the unified fabric or field of space-time, he will talk about a plurality of space-times or rather a community of what he calls actual occasions or subjects of experience that are human and non, mostly non. Um, so an atom is a subject of experience, a, 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 a sun, a star, a planet is a subject of experience. Organisms are subjects of experience. Um, and each one of these organisms gives rise to or enacts its own form of spatiality and temporality. And certainly it does so in communion with other subjects. So there is some sense in which there is a universal fabric, but it's not a pre-given, imposed uh, universal it's a constructed universal. It's something that this, the social relationships among the organisms, each of which has its own uh, perspective on being, and that being itself is made up of those perspectives, those um, evolving perspectives. But because those perspectives are internally related to one another, that because they share an emotional bond, um, because they share aesthetic tastes, um, because they're lured by the same eternal ideals that seem to hover just above their physical environments, like, like attractors that are drawing these organisms forward, um, that, that draw us as organisms in an ecology forward um, in a way that isn't simply reducible to what we are as individuals. So, you know, Whitehead's a pluralist, but the, plur the plurality of, of active, creative subjects of experience that make up reality, that plurality is striving for unity. And if you're Whitehead and you not believe in, but know or conceive of a certain kind of God, you know, God isn't a matter of belief only for Whitehead, but also a matter of um, a matter for thought and conception and reflection and systematization. And um, so he's a believer in a sense, but he's a theologian as well. And sometimes, you know, when we try to have religion with with just belief and no theology, I think we're setting ourselves up for 
um, we're becoming vulnerable to all kinds of superstitions and violences, perhaps. And we're at a time in our world today when religion, it's just failing. Um, the, the religions of the world, for the most part, uh, especially the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, they're failing to live up to um, their own inner spirit. And they're, they're giving rise to, to all sorts of maladies and social cancers uh, and delusions. And we need rationality and we need science. We need philosophical uh, reflection to clarify this confused situation of warring beliefs. And, you know, yeah, there's no view from nowhere. We can't get outside of our cultural inheritances. We can't get outside of our conditioning, but we can begin to observe our conditioning. And we can begin to condition ourselves. You know, there is a certain modicum of freedom there's the possibility for freedom hovering just out of our reach, and yet, though we can't ever quite grasp it, we're reaching for it. And in the act of reaching for it, we're helping, we hope, to realize it, to bring that idea of freedom into reality. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sort of describe what, what Whitehead's um, metaphysics would suggest, and you know, maybe, how long have I been going? 10 minutes. I'll just post this as an introduction to reading and then probably giving a little commentary on just the last section of Whitehead's chapter from Adventures of Ideas called Science and Philosophy. So that'll be, that'll be in part two.